Are you there? <laughs> oh, there she is. Hi. Oh, Lord. I'm a coffee. I'll push a button and it made me blurry. <laughs> oh, you're okay. Oh, there I am. Wow. How are you, my friend? Ah. Oh. Girl, how here. is sending Nugget off to? That was hard. I knew it was going to be hard. I, like, yeah, because knew... you were on the phone and you told me you're like, yeah, I know it's going to be difficult. Blah blah blah. I didn't know that it was going to feel like a death. That's tell and me. it's more like a. It's like a death of that version of your family. That's really. Oh, I've ha not had someone describe it that way. Okay. That's, that's what I wasn't prepared to feel of like, like I'm going to have dinner every night and he's not going to be sitting here. I see. I can't even talk about it. I was I'm not sorry. prepared for just like the that. loss of like 18 years of this is what my family looked like. And now it's never going to look like that again. It might be like a great thing on the other side of it. Like, yeah, but we'll that, this version of family is never going to be that way again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can resonate with that in terms of my divorce, even though, yes, I, you know, it was a good thing for me. It was still very much that grief of like, oh, it doesn't. Right look like it's looked for 10 years even on the surface like it's like oh it's, right oh okay I have actually never heard I have a lot of friends who are older and do which has been very helpful for me in my life people who are either older or they're just their phases of life ahead of me I've never had someone describe it that way that's actually very helpful I'm also, and, and I think you can probably resonate with this and because I can't speak to any other life, but I was a single mom with him for five years Yeah, and we like did everything it was in the world. Like, yes, it was, he, like, he was, he's just like my person, you know, yes. and, and where I have equal love for my children and it's just like we had a different dynamic to our relationship yes. and we grew up together and we went through hell together and we were yes. poor together and, yes. you know, we lived in a tiny apartment, like just, it was a different experience Yes. than I think maybe most people have when you're, you're married and you're raising kids together and it's just like a normal life. I agree. And so I was, I'm very attached to him. Yeah. And I'm not I mean, saying it's a a... <laughs> What'd you say? I don't know that it's a healthy attachment, but we're just very Well, no, I think fast. um I think single mothers with their kid, because I feel that entirely. You you understand your kids differently because it's just it's just you and your kid. Like it's just you and your kids. There's no there is no help. There is no one to fill that gap. There is no, like, it's just you and your kids. It's you and your kids when you wake up. It's you and your kids at night. It's it's just y'all. That's right. it. And they see the best versions of you, the worst versions of you, and there is no one to buffer. Right. There's For no, sure. like, hey, mom's <laughs> having a rough day. Go, there you know, dad's that. handling dinner. There's yeah. there's none of that. It's, no, we're there's all a rough, rough day. <laughs> We're all in this rough day together. We're all having a rough one. So no, I can understand that. I can understand. So I mean, really my kid, like, Jim is me and my two kids for seven years. So right. yeah, I get it. I get it. And I was just really ill prepared for the way that that was going to feel and impact me. And you just thought it would be fine. Like, oh, he's I going. I knew that it was going to be hard. And I knew that it was going to be sad. And, but like, he was so ready and we were so excited about his college experience. And, and I knew that he was going, he's going to a school that he absolutely just was called to be there. And it yeah. just feels so right. So I didn't have any problems with that. So I thought, okay, I'm going to be sad. Like when I leave him, but like, I was, 
I'm grieving. Like I've been in a, like a yeah. sit and shiva. Like that's how I feel. And how's your husband? Is he just like, it'll be, oh, he'll be fine. Yeah. He's, he's, well, I met with you in your grief. Oh, well, he's struggling, but we're getting through it. He's, he's just done, looking at you from across the room. Like, yeah, I mean, he's done fine. Like, like he'll he, be home at Christmas. You know that, right? Like he'll be home for Thanksgiving, right? He is not infected. <laughs> he is alive and they thriving. Never, but they never are. He is kind of like emotionally dead inside. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm so dramatically different from him that he just doesn't know what to do with me. He's working on it. He's trying. The perfect he, did, he did support like he helped my dad so my dad came in town my dad my parents are building a house in wyoming so they have oh, a house I in love wyoming and they bought 40 acres on a four thousand four hundred thousand acre ranch in wyoming that that people that they are selling off 40 acres of and so you have your 40 acres but then you have access to the other like 400,000 acres park? um it's right outside of Cheyenne oh I love I know. Wyoming. one of my favorite states yeah so my dad is splitting his residency so he has to live six months there and then six months here okay tax purposes and all that um yeah so my dad has been gone through this whole thing and my dad and I are super tight like ride or die remember and so he is he surprised me and came home this weekend and oh. so adam helped with that process oh that's sweet which bless his heart because i was so mad at him through the whole thing because i didn't want to go to church on sunday it was just like one like okay so now i'm gonna to go to church without going for the first time i just finally stopped crying now i'm gonna sob through church and he was like playing it like I'm going to make steaks after and all this stuff. And all I wanted to do was nothing like, yeah, just get under the weighted blanket me in my Shiva and go away. Yeah. <laughs> just just leave me alone. Leave me alone. So I was really, I was just in a mood. I was in such a bad mood the whole time. And then I walk in the door at church, like, like crying almost on the way to church. I walk in the door at church and my dad who doesn't go to my church is has like got a volunteer badge on is standing there in the door like it, as a greeter and I turned to my left and my dad was there and then you cry and then I didn't stop crying oh absolutely cried Not through mean. worship I was just on my face just I love I'm it. Telling, every, I and I'm sure everybody does not have this experience I'm just this is where I'm at in my life this is I mean, I would say own it. There's nothing wrong with it at all. I'm going to own it because I know that I think a lot of moms feel like this, but they feel like they don't have a right to feel this way. Yeah. Like this is I don't I'm know why. To. I don't know why. I mean, they uh, feel, feel how you want to feel about your children. I'm going to tell you something right now. This society, did, are you recording? Because you might want to cut this. This is <laughs> you're like, I know you too well. Here we go. Let's just start. Here's Bethany. Welcome Here's Bethany. Beth. Here we go. Here we go. No, this society dictating how mothers should show up with their children. I'm sorry. I don't need anyone else's permission to feel how I want to feel about my children and how I want to protect my children and how I want to care for my children. That's right. Period. The end. The only other person who gets to participate in the rearing and raising of my children who I birthed, and then for those who have adopted or what have you, but for your children is my spouse. Mm -hmm. That's it. Well, stop. I'm not asking for feedback. Literally, not asking. Right. Or at all. permission. It's no not feedback. even a permission thing for me. I'm not asking for feedback. <laughs> no That's one right. asks you. And that's I just, really how those... I say, like how I talk to people. I'm like, I didn't ask you how to raise my children. And by the way, the information that you're giving me on how to raise my children is not rooted in any of the fruits of the spirit. Anyway, I think it goes back to just a full, I just, it's a full attack on the family unit. And I think it, it, 
we could just talk about it for hours. It's just a full on attack of the family unit. And also it makes people uncomfortable. I mean, it's just like grief in any way of just that. I think feelings and strong feelings and strong thoughts really make people uncomfortable because maybe it challenges them in a certain way or it's not their experience. And because I have my experience, then they think their experience isn't right, you know? But that's so. the, and I'm not even like, that's the, I don't think anyone like get out of, get out. Let me raise me. Mike. Zion, Zion, Zion and me. Zion and love. <laughs> it's me. Um, okay, so great. So we just, what is, Hi. whoa, here we go. Just, anyway, we can, we can get started. This is how so we do. I can, oh. My point is I can understand why you feel, you get to, you get to have those emotions. And I think mothers get to have those emotions around the children who they are raising and sending out into a world that is catastrophic. <laughs> that is. And I have been all over the world. Hard. I've been yeah. all over the world, like not just you, I've been all over the world and there are wonderful people all over the world and there is catastrophe all over the world. And, you know, it's just crazy. out. It's crazy out there in them streets. <laughs> out there in them streets. Um, right before we got on, I was finishing the intro because we're about to study the Sermon on the Mount and that's my next. Um, so that launches this week and I was finishing up the intro, um, because I never do anything ahead of time. So, but just the concept of it is really the heart. Like mm. it's not a second law, but it's this idea of the inner attitude of God's people and their outward actions yeah. and just the world is catastrophic it and is just came and started talking about all these crazy things of you know that had to do with the heart and not the law and the people had lived so focused on the law that it was so it was such fresh water you know and it was radical then and it's radical now yes. which is <laughs> 2000 years later it's still radical quite radical yeah. The definition, when I was um, doing the research, one of the definitions was a radical commitment. This is about a radical commitment to God and his people. Mm. And I thought, dang, that's right. Because then like next week we jump into the Beatitudes and that's so different. It's so countercultural. To what's to right now in 2024, 20, 2025, 20, 2026. 20, I mean, and it's only going to get unfortunately worse, not right. better. Per the per the Bible, per God's word. He yeah, said, per God's no. word. Not that Only I'm a God. negative Nancy, but per per the scriptures. Just a reader of the word, a reader and a player of the word. A reader of the word. <laughs> okay, so since last time that you were on here, and last time you were on when we were off recording, you told me that you had found a man that a man a had man. Found a man that dropped Bella. A man to my friend that said she was never going to get married again. No. Oh my gosh. When we first met, I was very single. You were very single. And, and not wanting to get married. Still in a healing, still in such a healing process. And so, so much has changed. Um, and God has also just really honed in and redirected kind of your vision and your messaging. Because um, you had a different book planned. And now, and then... This is a totally different project. Um, and so why don't you just let everybody know, because some of them have been following you, you know, a long time. And some of you, you're brand new, but just like, what's going on? Like, where's God <laughs> at you right now? What? <laughs> what is What is happening with your life? What is going on? Oh my gosh. I can't even keep up personally with my own life and God's plans. So I've officially just decided to ride along and yeah. just kind of go with it day by day. But you're right. The book started out uh, being more so about perseverance and which is a theme in my life. How do you persevere and overcome? And then it moved into this area of, 
because people are tired. I've been tired. Um, how do you face forward? How do you get up again and again and again and again? And how do you have the grit to do it? And so that's the premise. And then writing stories, real stories um, from the valley floor. So not writing them from the vantage point of success of look at all the things that I overcome and did from here versus this is where I was <laughs> and this is what it felt like when I was right. there and um, not putting a pretty bow at the end of it. Cause it's also about this, this, this book, writing it, not with a pretty bow at the end of every story because life's not a movie. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we read stories where it's like, I overcame and now I have a million dollar business. Now my marriage is restored. Now that friendship worked out. Yeah, no, that's not um, how a lot of the stories show up throughout the book. And I believe people will find that re refreshing and they will find hope um, in those stories of like, oh, okay. Yeah, me too. And they will see God in those stories also because he doesn't forsake us um, in the trench and in the valley. So just because I've, I've had the opportunity to know more of your story, but you've had a lot of You've had a lot of worldly, like from a worldly perspective of success. Yeah. Um, and so I think a lot of people could look at you and be like, she's arrived. Like she's on top, you know, <laughs> yeah. like she, look at all the things, you know, all the accolades and all the, all the magazine covers and all yeah. these things that, you know, by worldly perspective, they could say like, she got, she's there. She's got, she's at the top of. So I think my question is, have you arrived? Oh God, no, no, uh, I don't know. And I don't even, I think arrived probably has been redefined um, from what it had been before. And I think before arrived to look like being in certain rooms, but that needle kept moving. So, you know, you got the title and then it was like, okay, but I need to, I need to be on that list. Then you got on the list. It's like, okay, well, I need to have this award. Okay. Then you got the, so the needle kept moving um, versus arrive now is God, are you pleased? What do you have for me to do today? And arrived is hearing well done, my good and faithful servant, right? And so I don't think I've arrived. I don't know what that looks like, but I know that I'm at peace and I know I have a lot of freedom. Um, and I know that when I serve and I ask God if he's pleased, I hear yes. Yeah. So maybe, maybe I've arrived. I... So do you think the Bethany of today has a new definition of success than say the you of 10 years ago? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, for sure. Without question, without question. The 10 years ago, um, success was constantly being on top. And the problem with that is you're the only one who can be on top. There's not room for anyone else. And I talk about this in the book about, uh, comparison and competition. And I'm pretty blunt about it. Um, when you compete, you have to be willing to break the neck of your competition. There's no fair play. We like to pretend that there is. This is outside of athletics. We like to pretend that there is fair play in competition. There is not. You have to be willing to break the neck of the person that you are competing with, which is the trap of comparison, right? And so that was the world that I was in. And so you fast forward, looks very different now. 
I don't compete. I don't compare. And I'm very content with my life and very content with what I'm doing. Um, because what I had before never really satisfied me. So I was never really satisfied. So that's the difference between yesterday and today. Yesterday being 10 years ago. Isn't that common? I mean, I do like business consulting on the side and mm -hmm. something that I've really noticed in a lot of business owners is this inability to be satisfied, which I like, I think that's like good in some ways of driving and attaining, like achieving and growing a business and that kind of stuff. But yeah. I also see it being very toxic to just this concept of like, we worked really hard and we hit this goal and that like, God helped me do that. And that's so good. And just to sit yes. in that, but instead to be so dissatisfied or even like, I, it, it even plays out into our own light, like our own walk with God of just like, I'm praying for this thing and I'm showing up for this thing. And then it happens. And just yeah. like, what's my next thing? Like yeah. this inability to have true, like satisfaction and peace of you know, right where, right where you are with, with what you have. Yeah. Cause you're always chasing something. It's always on to the next thing. Um, trying to keep up, uh, with whatever everyone else is doing or whatever stretch goals you have for yourself. Um, so yeah, there is, there is a churning and we live in a micro microwave push button society. So we live in a society that says right now, right now, right now, or you lose relevance. And if you lose relevance, you lose money. And if you lose money, then what are you doing? Right. And all of those things are allegedly attached to purpose. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of this end cycle that keeps going. And I know that you cover this concept a little bit. Um, and so I think one of my questions I had for us to talk about is just this concept of like, it's really easy to lose sight of our vision um, because we have a lot of shiny object syndrome in the culture today, especially with social media and just the internet really uh, <laughs> like major shiny object syndrome. So how, how do you reset direction, regain vision? Um, one, well, the question, I'll answer your question with a question that people should ask themselves is why did you lose sight of your vision anyway? So I think people have to dissect why they are being distracted. Um, but then more bluntly mute, like turn down the noise. And so if it's social media, then turn it off. Now I'll circle back to that because that's also a business avenue for some people. So that's a little hard to do, but you know, you have to, you have to turn the noise down. Um, so that's kind of one way, but still it gets to the root of why am I so easily distracted? Why am I so easily pulled away? What's going on in my life that something over here is pulling me this direction or that direction, that when the winds blow, that I'm blowing with the wind, that I'm not fully locked in and fully rooted. Um, and is it because you don't believe in what you're doing fully? that anything chaotic comes around that you kind of turn to the left and to the right. Um, you know, that's a question that you should ask yourself for people who have a business online and it's really, really hard to, I hear you, but I can't necessarily turn my phone off because my, <laughs> my work is online. Um, and then I get distracted by that. You know, there are all kinds of tools that can help you um, get, get around those things. But I would say, figure out how to turn the noise down. And a little more bluntly, if you're still listening and going, I can't figure out why, with all love and respect, as you start smiling, because you're like, there's the Bethany. Um, you may have a problem with self-control. And so that's where the self-accountability comes in. I know that in my own personal journey, when I have lost 
sight or when I struggle with vision, it's sometimes rooted in sin. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it totally could be. Rooted in pride um, or just the thought that I have a better vision for my life than God does. Actually, oh, like, that's a full sure. story. It's because I think that I have better vision than God does for me. Oh, sure. Instead, they're they're fighting each other. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been there. I've I've been there several times where I try to nudge God over mm -hmm. and um, reposition my wants and desires in front of His plan. Mm -hmm which is always hilarious because I can't see beyond what's in front of my face yet. I want to be in control. Yeah. I don't even know what I'm making for dinner tonight <laughs> and it's in five hours, but I want to be in control of my life. It's, <laughs> it is quite laughable really, but I want to, but I want to be in control of my life, but I can't, I cannot tell you what's going on tomorrow. Right. But I want, I gotta, I gotta, I got this. I got this figured out. It's just that God's timing feels very questionable sometimes. Like, why now? Like, hey, God, mm -hmm. why right now? Like, what do we do with that? Well, we have to remember that God is a God of dependency and a God of obedience. And what the scriptures tell us is not to lean on our own understanding, but to lean on him. And so it gets back to what you just said a few minutes ago. It's a pride issue. And it's a trust issue. So the question is, why don't you trust God's timing? Why don't you, has he ever failed you? Has he ever dropped you? Has he ever misguided you? Has he ever forsaken you? I'll wait. <laughs> the answer is no. Now, has he ever made you uncomfortable? Yes. <laughs> has he not moved fast enough? Yeah, he definitely has not moved fast enough. But ultimately, uh, it's a trust and a pride in a we make God like man. Because I know that I've been disappointed by people. I have been dropped by people. I have been hurt by people. I have been misjudged by people. People have promised me things and didn't deliver. But God is not like man. And so sometimes we have to remind ourselves, God is not like man and he will show up. He will show up for me. He will not leave me on the doorstep. He will not leave me waiting. He will not leave me wanting. Right. Yeah. Which Some is hard. Some of us are so afraid to trust that. Oh yeah, because the the pattern of our experiences says um, that if it happened before, it'll happen again, and that we are not important to God. And that rhetoric is out there, by the way. That you're not necessarily a priority, especially when you start jumping into comparison. Why that person right now and not me, God? Why is this happening for them and not me, God? Why haven't you healed me yet? But you healed them, God. So when you start doing that, for sure. There, I mean, I've done that. My opening chapter starts with me standing out in the rain, asking God those questions. And guess what? He didn't answer Remember I said there's no pretty bows? Because sometimes we ask God questions and he doesn't answer. So there's no, oh my gosh, she was standing in the rain and God reached down and wrapped his hands around me. No, I was cold. <laughs> and <laughs> wet. And wet. In rain boots. And then came back in the house with no answers to my questions. Did he answer sooner or later? Yes, which you will find out in the book. But yeah, but it's, those are the things that we grapple with. Now, what I will tell someone, because somebody is listening and they need an answer right now, 
is to remember the fact that you are so precious to God that he sent his most precious gift, which was his son. He sent his most precious gift, his son, for you. For you. That's how much of a priority that you are to him. So right. not about everybody else, but for whoever is listening and feels like, well, no, he that's how much of a priority. He sent his son for you. Um, not just to save you, but to fill in the gaps oh. where you're weak. Because where you're weak, he's strong. And he's just working things out for your good, according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. And so we just have to be patient and lean not on our, I'm in the, I'm in the Bible. I'm quoting. So for those who are, I'm quoting scripture. We just need to not lean on our own understanding and just trust the process. And the process is God's process. The process is not man's process because his ways are not our ways. I'm in the, am I in the text? You're on like, hey. Am I, in the, am I jumping from Old Testament to New? I'm in the text. She is just on a text journey in the yeah, scripture. I'm in the, but, but, you know, I'm giving people hope. And I preached right. that a couple Sundays ago. I said, hope is with a capital H. It is an emotion. It is a feeling. But hope has a capital H. Hope is Jesus. We cannot forget that. Hope has a capital H with it. It's a person. Right. And so if we remember that as we're grappling day in and day out, and even though I'm on this side of hope, because there are two sides of hope, there is weariness and grieving and pain, and then there's rejoicing and joy. But we cannot forget hope is a person. And if we remember that, then we keep reaching for hope over and over and over and over again, no matter what side of it that you're on. Right, right. Oof. That's, yes. Um, <laughs> I want to know why this book, why right now, what, because the, the concept behind your writing has changed. And I want to know why, like, why do you think that God has this book for such a time as this? I think a couple of reasons. One, because people are stuck and they need someone to help them get unstuck. Two, there are times, um, where I think people, men and women, and I'll come back to that, um, just need a little permission slip to snatch back the things that they've handed over, which is why the subtitle is Reclaiming Hope mm -hmm. after everything's fallen apart. So how do you snatch back the things that you've handed over freely that you, that you, opened your hand and said, okay, take this, take this, because you were compromising or you were making decisions in the short term because you thought it would benefit you in the in the long term. How do you take all of that back? Pick yourself up and take steps forward. And I think people need permission slips to do that. And I think I'm unique in doing that because I have led men and women on the corporate side. I have a command and control voice. I am unapologetic about my fear and failure. I do not care. You are not going to shame me. I do not have to, <laughs> I do not have to speak from a perch of comfort. I will show you all my wounds, all my scars, and I will show you where Jesus healed me. I do not care. And we can talk about all the things and I will sit with you there and I will not fast forward through the pain. We'll sit right there, but we're not going to stay at the pool. I'm going to move you from the pool because we will in stagnation. So we're not going to stay there. We're going to move forward. We'll move forward at your pace and with God, but we will move forward. But we're not going to wilt in stagnation. And so I think I have a unique voice in doing that. Um, and I think we need that right now. And why not me? Why? Why? Why not five foot one, loud, introverted, big hair, Bethany from Ohio, from, from a farm town. 
Here she is. Here, Here she, she is, is, everybody. Um, one thing that I love about you is the way that you present your message in such a creative way. Um, I love your social medias. I love how you use creativity. And I'd love to see this play out as you prepare for this book and as God has crafted this message. And just even talking to you um, a few weeks ago when we were talking on the phone, we talked about the cover of the book yeah. and how you were like, no, this is the cover. You know, that's that's very rare that an author yeah. gets to kind of trump the cover design and say, this is it. And this is and it the filming of the trailer and all that kind of stuff. So I want to know what's inspiring you right now. Like, because you're such a creep, because I think people think that God is just in this one area of our life. He's just oh, yeah. in this area of our life. He's just in the churchy area of our life. And, and this is why, like I've started keeping, I'm, I put like coloring pages and some of my tools, my Bible studies, because I want us to start tying in our creativity and the things that make inspire us and light us on fire. I want us to, I want the girls to tie that into I love like that. God, he loves your creativity. He loves the way that you're inspired and the things that light your fire, you know? And you do that well. And I, so I want to know a little bit about what inspires you and how you got there, really. So um, I think you're asking me two questions. I know, one, it's a big, that was a big no, one, one regarding the cover. So I spent 18 years in big box corporate America. So some of the brands like Gap, um, Express, which was under L Brands, Victoria's Secret, et cetera. And then uh, Scott's Miracle Grow, I was the SVP of HR there for many, many years. So I had access to branded advertising, billion dollars. So I, unbeknownst to me, I'm getting all of these downloads for 18 years of some of the country's top brands that some of you probably have in your home of like, oh, just in marketing meetings, brand meetings, et cetera, just watching all of this creativity happen and not even knowing that I had this energy towards doing these things um, and now being able to use it in my own space. But that's God's hand at, I mean, look at the magic of, not the magic, but the miracle of God's hand, me having no idea that I would be promoting a book, you know, 18 years later. Um, so that's kind of the cover piece and watching all of those things happen over all the years. And then in terms of how I'm inspired, I'm a big outdoors woman. So I do really radical things in my life, which influences how I show up online. So I am a mountain climber. I repel, I skydive. And I have no fear and I don't allow other people's fear to come into my bucket. And so because of that, I'm really, really just expressive um, in that way. So I'm inspired by the hiking and music. So really just all types of, I don't think there is a genre that I don't like, which you also see on my page. I don't get down with, modern hip hop like I I, I don't go so there bad. yeah it's I don't so I can't really constantly yeah, anything after anything so after bad. my college years I probably am not really and I wasn't into country until which I didn't have an issue with country my husband is a huge like 90s early 2000s country like huge oh my gosh he and I are best friends already tell me as a best friend I'm here oh Sitting he's here. and not like I'm I I'm so that's what so I'm like oh I kind of I really like, like okay so you know that's that's yeah I don't think there's a genre that I don't so those are the things that inspire me that's that was a long-winded answer I apologize but music and outside 
music in my friends in my friends so I have I mean you I count you as a friend and I have some pretty awesome friends I mean I my community of friends near and far even if I only talk to them two or three times a year I they are pretty phenomenal like ah, you know your pack the pack of women your family and your the the women that you run with are amazing. You just, whew, yeah, it's good. just, and I don't like I said, I'm not somebody. I don't have to talk all the all the time, but they call, we catch up, and I just I got some pretty phenomenal people in my life. So that's good. Yeah, one thing I did want to cover, and it it ties in a little bit before we before we talk a little bit more about the book and the timing and all that kind of stuff, I, I know that you cover boundaries a little bit in yeah. this work and, um, yeah, I have a whole chapter on it. <laughs> Christians have boundary issues. We just have boundary issues. We're just weird about boundaries on like both sides of the fence, both extremes. And so I just kind of want to know like, what's our problem and how, <laughs> what is our problem with boundaries? How do we fix it? Fix all the problems, Bethany. Fix all the problems. I I actually address boundaries in a whole chapter and I take it from three different angles. But to answer yeah. your question, one, I think we confuse um, setting boundaries with a lack of kindness, which is not the case. So that's issue number one. Issue number two, uh, those of us, now I'm putting myself in this bucket. Those of us who have strong personalities, uh, we don't hold other people with strong personalities accountable when they exploit other people's boundaries or don't honor them. So there is a lack of accountability happening when we see people disregarding people pleasers and things like we put it all on the people pleaser to this is what you need to do. And you like, no, no, no. How about we start checking those people that we routinely see mm -hmm. disregarding, like, why is the weight on the person who is really struggling to, you know, speak up and do all these things. So that's issue two. Um, and thirdly, I just think sometimes Christians have a really hard time. Um, what I want to say is doing the right thing. I'm not talking about sin or I, I'm just like, just speak up for yourself. That's what I mean. Yeah. I think believers have a hard time. Just speak up for yourself. It's, it's okay. Right. It's, it's okay if someone doesn't like you. It's okay to defend yourself. It's okay to articulate your feelings. And I put that stuff in the bucket of doing the right thing. Yeah. That's doing the right thing for yourself. And that's not selfish. We don't trust the Holy Spirit in us. Yeah. Because I think if we did trust the Holy Spirit in us, in our walk with God, if we were more confident in that in our life, if we put that in the right place in our life then we we would be able to maybe stand up for ourselves and to speak and to use our voice because we would know that we have the holy spirit inside of us and as we tap into him we get to be vocal we get to be vocal and those of us who and again i'm putting myself because one of the i call myself out in the chapter because mm -hmm. this is a chapter about again valley floor not from like these are all the things I call myself out in the boundary chapter. I actually tell a story of how I disregarded bound as a leader. This it was not a friendship conference. As a leader, was just like disregarding. So, in terms of the Holy Spirit, also being the other person and being like, oh, I should like chill out. And not do that and respect that or stand up for 
Because now I will clock very quickly and be like, did you not hear? Did you not hear what he, did you not hear what she said? Yeah. Did you, like, she said she didn't, or he said he didn't. Like, are we full, it, full, full personality comes out. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, did you not hear that? In doing it in love and in kindness, and again, Holy Spirit led, because it doesn't mean that you jump into every, every conversation either um, in doing it in kindness. But I, again, I just, I think that people, people struggle with defending themselves for a lot of different reasons. And, you know, my message is speak up for yourself. It's okay. Speak up, speak up for yourself. Jesus spoke up for a lot of people. He, he really did. I mean, people always want to use the example of him getting on the boat and, you know, that was him setting boundaries. No, no, just read the gospels. He spoke up a lot for people in the boat. He was 10 toes down with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Like, hold up. No, 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 no. He was helping other people establish. I'm just, I don't know. Am I in the scripture or am I not? Tell me, tell me if I'm wrong. Right there, just dancing right there in the New Testament. Here we are. <laughs> just dancing, dancing right there and encouraging people and doing it in love. But he was also openly establishing. Try it. She can, hold on a second. She can wash my feet. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So anyway. Boundaries. So interesting. I do. I have one more question after that, the closing yeah. question, but. I, somebody listening is on the Valley floor, yeah. they're on the Valley floor, and I just want to know what you have to say to her today. I spoke about this, I think the last time we were together, but I do think it's applicable now. So I'm going to repeat it again. And it's around the concept of continuing to reach. Um, so the story of the woman with the issue of blood, and that's the person I resonate with the most in the Bible. And the reason I do is because the courage that it takes to keep reaching over and over again. And what I want to say to that woman is you are reaching and yes, Jesus feels you touching the hem of his garment. Because sometimes we're reaching and we wonder if he feels our touch and if he hears our cry. And yes, he does. And he is going to answer and he is answering. And when we pray our prayers and when we cry our cries, know that they are heard. We just maybe haven't arrived to the answer yet. And that answered prayer could be tomorrow. It could be in an hour. It could be in three months. But new, do not question the fact that he hears you and um, the answer to your prayer and your ache and your hurt um, is coming. And uh, he is not going to forsake you. And I'm saying that as someone who has felt forsaken by God and found out that I was not. But I have definitely felt forsaken and I was proven wrong multiple times. Multiple times. Right. So that's what I would and say to her. In order to arrive, if we just think about it, if we just think about how to arrive somewhere, you have to stay on the journey. You yes. have to stay on the journey with Jesus. You have to stay yeah. on there so that you can arrive. Because yeah. On the journey. And the steps, um, the steps forward may be trembling steps. And I say that a lot because sometimes when we think about moving forward or facing forward um, or just getting up, we think that that means the steps are bounding or we're sprinting. There are times when my steps were trembling steps and I was afraid. 
And in my fear, Jesus carried me because I couldn't move, but I was being carried. Um, and then there were times where my hand was being held and I was taking just small trembling steps. And I don't feel ashamed in saying that. There's no part of me that feels like, oh, I should have been stronger. Or I should have been able to sprint through that season of my life. No, that's where I was. And that's what I was capable of doing in that moment. That's what I had the capacity to do in that moment. Um, but because I took those little itty bitty steps or because I was carried, because God knows what we have the capacity to handle, this is where I am now in 2024. Because I didn't wilt in stagnation. I did something. And mm -hmm. sometimes the something is just praying or crying out. Um, and that that's okay too. So that's what I would say to that woman. I've taken more trembling steps than I have bounding forward in full confidence. I was Most taking of trembling my... steps last week. By the <laughs> way, I was taking trembling steps last week. By the way, I was on my couch crying last week. So, oh. you know, the... This is this is a cyclical, you know, process because this is life and we have good days and bad days, but the Lord remains faithful through it all. And that's all we have is his faithfulness. That's all we have. That is what my life shows is that God is faithful. That's it. With all the success, all the pain, all the brokenness, all the joy, that's it. That's the only through line through my whole story is that my God is faithful. That's it. <laughs> That's it. He is faithful. He is faithful to me. I don't know about anybody else. All I have is my story. That's it. And in every season from when I was a little girl stuttering, he was faithful then. And as a 40 year old woman, almost 41 years old, unsure of what the future holds for me, he is still faithful to me. He's faithful to me and I'm nobody. And I don't say that because I'm gonna start crying. Oh my God. I don't say that out of like a, just something to say, I am nobody. And he has been faithful to me every day of my life. And I have not been faithful to him. And yet he continued to show up for me over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Even when I disregarded him. Even when I said, do you love me? Do you care for me? Faithful. That's what this book is about. Yeah, it's about grit. Yeah, it's about resilience. But from start to finish, from the first page to the last page, oh my God, he was faithful to her. Mm -hmm. Faithful to her. And for what? Why? So you could be right here. Yeah, but so undeserving. So yeah. undeserving. And isn't that the glory of the Lord? Yes. That even still... Even still. Even still. <laughs> My God. My God. Even still. Even still. Is this the first podcast I've cried on? Oh my God. Good. Don't listen. I can't cry anymore. I wounded my tear duct. <laughs> I'm not allowed to cry for like three days. Um, <laughs> that's all. Oh. Okay. We're going to close this out. But the last question that I always ask is where do you see a movement of God right now? Oh, I, um, so I see a movement of God with people who are weary and tired, mm -hmm. which I'm sure is a very interesting response, <laughs> but you know, I'm always good for one of those. <laughs> and here's why I think people are tired of rhetoric and surface because they're tired in their real life. So they want solutions, they want answers, they want real, they want community. If you're gonna talk about Christ, give me Christ. Don't give me, I, I want hope without all the fluff. Yeah. And I think people are demanding that. They want truth, they want real Bible. 
Don't give me all these extra translations and whatever. No, 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 no. Give me Jesus. Right. Give me Jesus. And that's where I think there's this swell, um, this swell happening where people are just, look, I'm tired. I'm weary. And I'm, I'm tapping out of all of this noise just, and people are starting to seek out just unvarnished truth. And I think it's happening not only all over the country, but all over the world where people are like, you know what, this, whatever we've been doing for the last five years ain't working. So give me real, give me truth, give me authenticity. And so that's, that's what I feel like I'm seeing and what people are craving and what I want in my own life. Mm-hmm. So that's how I would answer that. Surprising, but not surprising. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, let's give the details about the book and where to go. Cause we can pre-order it right now. Pre-order it right it now. Face, face forward. forward. Yes. Face forward. It's available. Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Target. It's out October the 1st, pre-order now. Um, you can find me online, Bethany Ricks on Instagram or my website. Um, yeah, it's available everywhere books are sold. Uh, it, Go get we're excited. It. We're excited. Now, I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm going to link all of this in the show notes. We'll link it all. And so you can find this and find that way to pre-order and then give give a follow to my girl because you're gonna love it just love I'm hoping it. it's gonna be it's you know it's great it's personal stories it's professional stories um but all truth and it should be a good time yeah in a book for men and women which I love yes yes um, because I th- I think there's a space for that and I was just my friend Brian Dixon was like who can I who can I read? That's a woman. She's like, I got a ton of books from guys, but tell me who, and I put, I dropped your name in the comments. I was like, listen, thank you. Get it after this. Cause I feel like you have a voice. You have a unique voice that meets, thank uh, you. that meets men and women. And I feel like that's so important right now. So, and I led, um, you know, I led men. Yeah. And the, I mean, my team was mostly, I mean, I had a lot of men on my team. I had over a hundred people across the globe and half of them were men (laughs) and all of my peers were men. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to do it on, on this side too. Cause why not? My husband's a pastor. I preach at a church that's congregation men in there. So yeah. Ooh, I didn't know that was allowed, but wait, don't get me started. (laughs) Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Whole, whole microphone. everything. Women. Yeah, whole Sunday. Sunday. I know Sunday, two back to back Sundays too. Not even on Mother's Day. I don't even know what's happening. Yeah, I just preached the the last two Sundays because my dad was out of the. Those who don't know, my dad is also my husband's a pastor. My dad is also a pastor, and my dad was out of the country, and I've had to preach the last two Sundays. Wild, you are wild. Just wild okay friend thank you so much for being here just thank you for having me i always love it i love this community i love your community and i love you i love you too and uh we're gonna get this book out we're gonna get this book out i'm so excited excited. okay you guys thank you so much for being here on this this really special episode uh remember that we have uh every wednesday we meet back here we study god's word and you can find out more about all of these things uh, in the show notes and um if you have any questions or want to connect in any other way you can always um send me a dm or uh an email at the tribe at christianfell.com i'll see you guys next week bye y'all oh that was just all the things Did you, was it was it all right fire and rain and everything yes it was, was it really- okay was it everything you wanted perfect. everything you needed it always is it's just perfect are your kids back at school no i just told them they had to go outside and play in the field until we were done i'll find a field somewhere go find a field somewhere and play outside we go back next week yeah they go back it the next the week after that yeah.
they go after and then the house will be silent all day and those questions were good thank you sorry that well, send them on little, to your person <laughs> i know i'm like we're a little earlier than oh, their, we are. we're doing this really early this is their schedule but i i'm like i'm getting them in getting them in I'm now gonna hang, i'm gonna hang on to this and probably drop it like beginning or middle of september because i feel like that'll be launch time Perfect. for you yeah uh, so we'll hang on to it and then I'll drop it in that mid-September timeline. I can't believe I cried. I've never cried on a podcast. I can't believe you cried either. That was such a, but that was so important. That was such an important message at that moment. It was really good. That was just, not, me, just, not a tear. Like, here I am. <laughs> yeah, it's like, that's it. Who cares? That's Faithful. Good. I loved it. How's married life? Oh my God. He's a nugget. He's, he's a nugget. Just, he's perfect. Uh, he's just...